Hey everybody, in the next few weeks I want to share with you some videos that are a summary of notes from this book, The Internal Enemy. This is primarily for my family, my brothers, my cousins, uh, nieces and nephews. This book covers the area that our family comes from, southeastern Virginia. It starts around the time of the American Revolution, Haitian Revolution, and ends at the time of Nat Turner's uh, revolt. Uh, now, our family comes from an area called uh, Isle of Wight County in Southampton County in southeastern Virginia, Tidewater, Virginia. And uh, this is the primary, is really rich historically and culturally, but this is a primary area that this book also takes place in. The review says his brilliant new book illuminates the crucial role runaway slaves played in the devastating British campaign that led to Washington, D.C.'s burning. So many people are from that area or have come out of that area. Uh, Dred Scott from Southampton County, um, the ladies who are featured in the film Hidden Figures, they're from that area, uh, the film Loving vs. Virginia, uh, the people there from a little bit further west but same cultural uh, situation. Nat Turner's Rebellion happened not more than four miles away from where um, our great-great-grandfather Mr. Albert Hunley uh, grew up. Uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's family was involved in this situation of fleeing to the British um, and that's how they ended up in Canada uh, from that area. So it's a really interesting area historically and culturally but also to understand the psychology of the American imagination of who African Americans are and the idea of the internal enemy is really important. Uh, Terrence has a lot more information, Danny has a lot more information, but hopefully this is a step to compiling all of that so we have a better understanding of who we are. So you have the first Black Republic of Haiti to the south, you have the British Naval Post of Nova Scotia to the north, and the Chesapeake region starting from Washington, D.C. You have the Potomac, Rappahannock, and Mattaponi Rivers. You have the Pamunkey, James, and Appomattox Rivers all flowing into the Chesapeake Bay. You have, going further south, you have um, Southampton and Olive White County, directly across from Newport News and Hampton. And within Olive White and Southampton, you have the the Blackwater, the Nottawai, the Marin Rivers all flowing down into the Chowhan, which goes into the Albemarle Sound of North Carolina. The rivers were the main transport, the main highways at that time with such poor roads. Directly east of Southampton and the Isle of Wight, you have the Great Dismal Swamp, which was a very important runaway uh, community living within Virginia. And later I'll post a map showing the locations of most of the Crockers and Hundleys within those counties. First question, what are six major rivers running through Virginia, what's called the Tidewater area? Question number two, what year was the Haitian Revolution and which year did the U.S. finally acknowledge the existence of Haiti? Number three, who is it that said this, our country will be peopled? The question is, shall it be peopled with Europeans or Africans? What was the main issue? in the Missouri crisis in 1819 and 1820. The major rivers in Virginia are the Potomac, the Rappahannock, the Mattaponi, the Pamunkey, the James, and the Appomattox. The Haitian Revolution was in 1791. The U.S. did not acknowledge Haiti until 1862, the time of the Civil War. They had an embargo on them until that time as well. Um, almost between 6,000 that tried, about 2,000 successfully escaped to the British during the War of 1812, fled, and the majority were taken to Nova Scotia, Trinidad, and New Brunswick. Um, the man who said, give me liberty or give me death, also said, our country shall be peopled, either with Europeans or Africans, Patrick Henry. And the issue of the Missouri crisis of 19, 1819 and 1820 was whether or not slavery should be allowed in the westward expansion of the country. And the reasoning of the Virginians was that it must be allowed uh, in order to diffuse the possibility of slave revolt within uh, Virginia and the other slaveholding. The introduction starts with a story about a man who escaped with a group of others to the British in 1814. And the letter that he wrote back to his master after he was already in Nova Scotia doing well as a blacksmith. He wrote, Sir, 
I take this opportunity of writing these lines to inform you of how I am situated here. I have a shop and a set of tools of my own, and I am doing very well. When I was with you, you treated me very ill, and for that reason, I take the liberty of writing and informing you that I am doing as well as you, if not better. When I was with you, I worked very hard, and you neither gave me money nor any satisfaction. But since I've been here, I've been able to make gold and silver as well as you. The night that Coakley stopped me, he was strong, but I showed him that subtlety was preferable to strength and brought away others with me who are, thanks to God, are also doing well. So I remain Bartlett Shanklin. P.S. My love to all my friends. I hope they are doing well. The introduction brings up the point that the revolution in Haiti that, that also sent to the U.S. its first wave of white refugees from that um, area had put it in their minds the threat saying that the Virginians had not yet adopted the consoling myth of the mid 19th century that slaves were weak, happy, and docile. They had accepted the fact quite frankly that they had bred their own internal enemy saying most Virginians dared not emancipate because they dreaded free blacks as even more menacing than slaves because they were less supervised. Virginians uh, formed a strong opinion against the Missouri crisis of 1819 and 1820, expressing a dread of being trapped in a region with a restive black majority. 11 questions from the chapter revolution first chapter in 1765 what was the capital of virginia and what was its largest seaport question number two what was the percentage of the population of virginia that was enslaved of those who were enslaved what percentage of them had been born in virginia in 1772 what was the main principle of the somerset versus stewart case in 1775 who was lower done more and what did he try to do um they do. Um, how many slaves were freed for fighting on the Patriot side during the Revolutionary War? How much did the slave population increase over that period of time? What is primogenitor? In 1791, what was the French response to the Haitian Revolution? And in the 1790s, a man who was worth $300, how much could he be rented for? A woman who was worth $200, how much could she be rented for? And 1803, what was the price difference between a slave sold in Virginia versus one sold down in South Carolina? In 1765, the capital was Williamsburg and Norfolk was the largest seaport. 40%, almost half of the population was enslaved and nine out of 10 of those had been born in Virginia. They were not recent uh, comers. In 1772, the main principle of the Somerset versus Stewart case was that anyone uh, even enslaved who touched British soil, they were automatically freed at that time. So it gave motivation for those to try to escape to the British Navy ships. Lord Dunmore in 1775, he tried to use the local blacks against the protesters and he was the last uh, royal governor of Virginia. The Revolutionary War during that period, 500 slaves got their freedom for fighting on the American side against the British. Uh, the slave population increased by 25,000 25, over that period. Uh, primogenitor is the principle that the oldest son inherits all of the, not the youngers. So when this was abolished, what this did was it expanded wealth throughout the population. Also, this was the main thing that divided slave families. So when a master died, the slaves uh, were divided as part of property as well. Um, the French response to the Haitian Revolution was initially abolition. Napoleon reversed it later, but that was the initial response, abolition. So for many reasons, Haiti was a negative example for the U.S., just to the South. In the 1790s, you could rent a man for $30 for a year, whereas it would have cost $300 to purchase him. And a woman who would have cost $200 to purchase her, you could rent her for only $11 for a year. So this also expanded the uh, participation in the slave system throughout the society. And in 1803, um, a slave was going for 600 in South Carolina, whereas only 400 in Virginia. So you can see the profit and the motivation. It's about a time that uh, in 8, 1781, Lord Cornwallis led a British army up the James River to occupy and plunder Richmond. 
Cornwallis' army attracted 4,500 runaways, including 23 from Jefferson's estate, 16 from George Washington's in Mount Vernon, and some from St. Je St. George Tucker's uh, plantation. And speaking about the impact of uh, the revolution in Haiti, Jefferson in 1797 said, if something is not done and done soon, we shall soon be the murderers of our own children, for the revolutionary storm now sweeping the globe will be upon us. So first question from the chapter night and day, which emphasizes contrast in the system. Why did Thomas Jefferson insist that slaves marry from within the same uh, plantation? What was the typical salary of an overseer? From 1785 to 1831, how many whites had been killed by slaves, mostly overseers? What were the most common crimes that slaves were punished for? What did white Virginians call nighttime? What was the main fear of white Virginians? Why did most people run away? What was the largest runaway community within Virginia? And what shocked a French traveler when going around the state? Thomas Jefferson insisted that slaves marry from the same uh, property in order that they didn't travel at night. Usually the men traveled at night to go visit their wives on other plantations, so he wanted them to be fresh and ready to work in the morning. Um, the, the annual, the average overseer salary was 200 uh, a year, including almost from anywhere from a tenth to a quarter of the harvest. Um, 148 whites were killed over that period. 1785 to 1831, and that's only about three years, which is quite low compared to the population. So the fear of slave violence was actually much greater than the reality. Uh, the most common crimes that slaves were punished for were arson and theft. White Virginians called nighttime nigger day, nigger day time because they said that's when blacks were out the most. One of them compared them to being like cats who go out at night and come back in the morning. The main fear of Virginians was being killed at night while they were asleep by their own slaves. Uh, why did most run away just to visit their family who were on other plantations? The largest maroon community was the Great Dismal Swamp near what's now Suffolk in, um, in Virginia. And what shocked a French traveler? He was shocked that there were many slaves who were, quote, almost as white as I am. This is due to the large amount of racial mixing that was going on in Virginia. Traveler Jesse Torrey heard Virginians complaining about living in a country where one cannot go to bed in the evening without the fear of being massacred before morning. Torrey gave an example of one master who every night went to his upper room through a trap door and kept an ax by his bedside for defense. Visitors to Virginia noted the slaves often had the brown skin of mulattoes rather than the black skin of Africans. And the author talks about Thomas Jefferson's examples. And um, the next part he says, Virginians worried that mass emancipation would reverse the sexual power dynamic. Instead of white men impregnating enslaved black women, free black men would breed with white women to accelerate, to accelerate the making of a mixed race. In 1806, a legislator warned that if blacks continue to mix with the whites as they have done already, as we daily see, I do not know what kind of people the Virginians will be in a hundred years. Colonel John Taylor dreaded the emergence of a body politic as monstrous and unnatural as a mongrel half white, half Negro. Jefferson also worried that we were in danger of falling to the ranks of our own Negroes, even though he himself had six mixed race children. He wanted to send slaves away to Africa as colonists, but it was already too late to separate the intermingled peoples of Virginia. This is from the chapter, third chapter, Blood. What was one of John Adams' policies that Jefferson was opposed to? Uh, number two, why did people in Williamsburg think that an insurrection was coming in 1802? Um, Gabriel's Rebellion in 1800 was planned to take place in which city and what were four um, results from that um, plot um, as far as uh, banning uh, manumission freeing of slaves what did the Virginia legislature decide to do in 1806
the slave, why was the import of slaves banned in 1808, and how did that um, benefit Virginia? Well, number one, Thomas Jefferson was opposed to John Adams trading with Haiti. He thought it was a terrible example. Um, number two, they thought an insurrection was coming in Williamsburg just because a man insulted, a slave insulted a white man on the street. Thereafter, anyone who uh, gave insults or who was too uh, insubordinate was whipped and interrogated. Um, uh, Gaber's Rebellion was planned to take place in, uh, in Richmond um, because of weather and some other things that it didn't work. But uh, as a response to that, there was a 9 o'clock curfew put in place in Richmond. Any uh, African American outside after 9 o'clock was stripped, whipped, and imprisoned. Also, the slave patrol's frequency was um, escalated and education was stopped altogether. Education for blacks was not allowed, it was not allowed, and also worship was not allowed in private. There had to be at least one white non-Quaker uh, present for every uh, worship service. The compromise that they made on manumission in 1806 was that you could manumit slaves, you could free them on the condition that they left the state within a year. And so basically the effect was that um, it it um, it stopped manumission basically. Um, and lastly, the 1808 ban on imports were important because uh, Jefferson felt that there was already enough um, slaves in Virginia to supply the demand, and also that increased their value since there were no new imports coming in. They could maintain higher prices for their slaves when they were exported to the southern parts of the U.S. Okay, nine questions for the chapter Warships, the fourth chapter. While the British Parliament banned slavery in 1807, at that time, how many Africans were still enslaved in the British West Indies? Um, number two, why was um, British naval power so important and how many seamen, how many sailors did they have at that time? Um, number three, of those sailors that the British had out there, <clears throat> how many of them were uh, black or African? And why did they use black African sailors uh, in the West Indies? Um, number four, what was the proportion of Trinidad that was free? And why was that beneficial, according to... While America remained neutral in the wars between Napoleon and Britain, um, what was the difference in... Um, what was the difference in salary for uh, American seamen versus one who was enlisted in the British Navy per month? And what proportion of the American um, sailors were actually British by birth by 1807? Um, seventh question, why did... Uh, American slash British sailors feel that the um, that the British were treating them like niggers. Uh, question number eight: What were slave holding states referred to as at that time? And last one, number nine: What was the cause of the Richmond Theater burning in eighteen eleven? that the British Parliament banned the importation of slaves, there were still 600,000 enslaved in the West Indies. And this was a, one of the reasons that the Americans felt the British were hypocritical. Um, they had a total of 100,000 sailors um, in their Navy, uh, mostly for fighting with uh, Napoleon. Um, the black troops were so important in the British West Indies for the reason that they felt that they deserted less often than the white soldiers. They were less prone to disease. And they also had a, a, a mixed effect. On the one hand, they protected against slave revolt in the West Indies. On the other hand, they also uh, reduced the racial justification for slavery by their presence. There were 8,000 in the British West Indies. And um, one-fifth of Trinidad was free. And the reason that this was important, according to George Cunning, was that a, that a free 
uh, African was much more likely to defend the land rather than someone who was enslaved. They would look at the French or others as liberators. And at that time, Americans were paying seamen $15 a month while the British Navy only paid seven a month. And this difference in pay and um, workload caused the uh, American uh, sailors to be two-fifths British by 1807. Now, because of this, the British started to um, impress a lot of soldiers, taking them from uh, American ships that were trading with France, taking them off the ship, seizing them, sometimes um, whipping them. So they thought they thought that this treatment made them as low as niggers in their eyes because of the way the British treated them. Also, sometimes they were hung for being deserters of the British uh, Navy. And especially during the war with um, the French, the war with Canada, when the U.S. tried to invade Canada, the slaveholding states were not referred to as the South. They were not referred to as the Confederacy. That was co referred to as Negro country. And, uh, people initially assumed that some slaves had intentionally set the theater of fire uh, in order to kill a lot of the notables of Richmond, but later found out that a candle was just placed carelessly too close to the stage, and that was the cause of the fire. But it showed the paranoia that they assumed whenever there was a fire, especially something as significant as that one, that it was a slave insurrection behind it. Um, so the governor of Virginia was one of those who were killed in the uh, theater fire. And the new governor, James Barber, what were uh, four of his complaints about the militia in Virginia and their inability to cope with a possible uh, British invasion? Um, secondly, um, when the Americans tried to invade Canada, in which two cities did they suffer really humiliating defeats, uh, surrenders, in 1812? And also, the British ships started entering and seizing and burning uh, American ships in what year? And f number four, why were people so reluctant to go to Norfolk for military service? And number five, why did officials in Matthews County decide to start confiscating and destroying unguarded and undocked canoes? So Governor Barber, he complained that the Virginia militia was underfunded. They were undermanned because of the Canadian invasion. They were poorly equipped. Less than one out of five had uh, working uh, muskets. And they were poorly trained um, for a number of reasons. And this also exposed the class divisions within the state because those who were rich enough could pay for exemption. They didn't have to serve. Um, the two major uh, surrenders during the Canadian um, invasion was in Detroit and Buffalo and the reason they were so poorly uh, executed was because they resisted calling more um, soldiers from Negro country because they didn't want an insurrection in their absence. And British warships started to come into the Chesapeake Bay in 1813. People did not want to come to Norfolk because they feared of dying of malaria in that climate. And Matthews County started to seize and destroy unguarded canoes because slaves were using them as a means. So Napoleon suffered a major defeat in Russia. The British allocated more resources to the American front. And by 1813, how many British warships were in American waters uh, compared to the year before? And how many warships did the American have? Uh, what was the main defense that Americans had? Uh, number three, what was the, why did some people view it as a civil war? Um, who were the traitors on both sides, in their opinion? Who were the traitors for the British? Who were the bra traitors uh, from the American point of view? And Admiral Cockburn, why was he seen as a villain by the Americans, and what new strategy did he want? And um, who were the first to contact with the British? Which slaves were the first to contact with the British? Who were the outliers? And finally, uh, Vice Admiral Cochrane, what was his campaign goal for the 1814 um, campaign against the Americans. So by 1813, there were 129 uh, British warships in American waters. It was a double 
uh, the number that were there the previous year, and this was five times more uh, warships than the Americans had. Uh, they cited as the main defense for the Americans is actually the landscape, the pines, the swamps, the forests. Uh, no one knew how many forces the Americans had behind the, the front lines. There were mosquitoes, there was malaria, there were the summer storms that sometimes capsized ships, destroyed barns. So all of this made them think that the Chesapeake was a, a new world, a wild world. And they had no intention of trying to conquer the country but just wanted to harass the Americans and punish them for their as as rebels. And uh, people who were born British found in the U.S. Against, fighting against the British were hung as traitors. Uh, the Americans, they viewed those who lived along the waterfront that helped the British either by uh, water, food, information, um, commerce as the traitors. And um, the British viewed uh, sailors who deserted as the traders, the main traders. So a lot of times when they went on land to get uh, supplies, a lot of the sailors would desert. And um, according to the book, the majority of the deserters were Irish, and they more so looked at it as a civil war because of the oppression that they faced in their own country. Uh, Adam was uh, viewed as a villain because he was known for his, his raids, destroying towns, destroying mills. Uh, but on the other hand, the book gives accounts of people who were impressed by his demeanor and his attempts to win people over through bribery, uh, money, uh, money, and politeness to their cause. Both sides were trying to persuade the others. Also, Admiral Cockburn wanted to replace a lot of his troops with uh, African American slaves because he felt that they were stronger and they were less likely to desert than um, the, the other sailors that he had. And the first uh, slaves that they met were the seamen, the ones who were fishing, crabbing, oyster raking, or doing transport. And they were the first one to get in contact with the British. And, they... and now the outliers were people who lived um, in swamps or forests um, throughout the area uh, as refugees, as runaways, as maroons. And these people um, joined the British whenever the ships passed by, by the shore. Uh, Vice Admiral Cochrane said, let the landings you make be more for the protection of the desertion of the black population than with a view to any other advantage. The great point to be attained is the cordial support of the black population. With them properly armed and backed, with 20,000 British troops, Mr. Madison will be hurled from his throne. Now the seventh chapter is basically an in-depth case report of one Carlton plantation where they had the highest number of slaves who escaped to the British. And I'm just going to skip over that because it's too much detail. But um, chapter eight tells the story of a lot of different people who fled to the British. And I'm just going to give a few of those stories. Um, one of them that starts off is about a very, very well-known lawyer, Walter Jones, and um, his body servant, his most trusted uh, slave, uh, Ben, was a hale man, uncommonly large and strong, trusted and the most trustworthy in every business. And there were some others that, that fled with him. Um, but the point is, is that after this um, Ben escaped, and he led uh, a group of others back to the ship. He left his master homeless and without any wealth and a complete change of fortune. Lieutenant James Scott recalled another shrewd fellow who had been extremely ill used by his master. So he ran away to the warship, leaving behind his wife and children. The ties of paternal and marital affection, however, rendered the poor fellow restless and unhappy. So he obtained Cockburn's leave to rescue them. Expecting such a return, the owner forced the slave family to sleep with him in his locked bedroom. But the shrewd fellow broke in and brought off his wife and children in the boat, which the admiral had kindly sent to facilitate his object. However, not all made it. The same uh, Lieutenant Scott recalled that canoes full of runaways now constantly sought the protection of some of the squadron, and it's to be feared that many perished during the dark nights by drifting out to sea. Lieutenant James Scott recalled another shrewd fellow who had been extremely ill-used by his master. 
so he ran away to the warship, leaving behind his wife and children. The ties of paternal and marital affection, however, rendered the poor fellow restless. There are a lot of really good stories in this chapter, but the last one I'll say is this one about this uh, Soderly plantation of John Ruby Platter. Uh, there was a man named Peregrine Young, most valuable house servant, $700. Ignitus, $800. A month later, all four returned to his plantation, bearing arms and wearing the red jackets of the colonial marines. They guided a raid that liberated 44 more slaves, 9 men, 12 women, and 23 children. And the platter, when he saw the British captain, he told him, It's improper, sir, to take slaves and put weapons in their hands is even more improper. The captain replied, who began the war? There are a lot of really good stories in this chapter, but the last one I'll say is this one about this uh, Soderly plantation of John Ruby Platter. Uh, there was a man named Peregrine Young, most valuable house servant, $700. Ignitus, $800. A month later, the article focuses on how people who were even on different plantations coordinated so that they can all get their family out at the same time. A lot of amazing stories in this one chapter about that, but it also focused on the fact that a lot of people were related to their so-called owners by blood. Uh, Virginians denied their relatives on the other side of the arbitrary race line. That tragic polar polarity drove some enslaved people to seek freedom far away from white relatives who would have owned them as property but disowned them as kin. Also, something else that's really interesting is here is how the masters tried to persuade their slaves not to escape and told them that they would be sold off to Jamaica. But a lot of them replied that even if they sell me off to Jamaica, they can sell me off to South Carolina here. So what's the difference? And after some escaped to the ship, the British allowed the owners to come back to try to persuade the slave to come back with soft, polite accents. They always refused to return. So here are several questions for the chapter fight, which covers the campaign that led to Washington, D.C.'s burning. Where was the British naval base located in the Chesapeake Bay? The 3rd Battalion of the Royal and Colonial Marines consisted of how many? Uh, who were the supernumeraries? How did Marylanders try to secure protection of their property? Why would Maryland ladies Maryland ladies send bouquets to the British uh, fleet. How many troops did Vice Admiral Cochrane request as support and how many troops did the British end up sending over? The battle before they entered Washington DC took place on which date and why did the militia flee? And in which city did Francis Scott Key write his um, Star Spangled Banner? So the British established their naval base on Tangier Island with a force of about 500 troops, 300 of which were former runaways. Supernumeraries were uh, older people, women, children who were not able to fight. So a lot of them who weren't able to work directly there were sent to Nova Scotia. Uh, Marylanders wanted protection for their properties, so a lot of them acquiesced to the British invasion and even went so far as to ban or uh, bar any militiamen from taking refuge in their homes and their towns uh, for fear of British raids. To such an extent, some of the ladies sent bouquets to the British Navy with the expressed request for them not to send their black troops in a raid. Cochran requested, Cochran requested 20,000 troops, but only received 3,700 as support. So that limit his, limited his goals and his plans of what he was able to accomplish. He originally wanted to uh, take over uh, altogether and abolish slavery, but he was not able to do so. The Battle of Bladensburg took place on August 24th. There were 7,000 militia and 4,500 British troops, but the militia ended up fleeing because of a rumor that had spread that an insurrection was taking place at the very moment uh, in DC. So they fled back. And 
And Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner uh, watching the events happen in Baltimore. Runaways, they gave them, uh, as initiation to their Marine service, the red coat. So they became red coated. And one particular example of Harry Butler, the officer asked if he would be willing to go back and kill his master, and he directly replied, yes. Others sought to wipe off old scores, and some were seen just a few hours removed from being on the plantation with a cutlass, a short sword, in their hands already. And Cockburn had initially not been too enthusiastic about having black soldiers, but when he saw how quickly they advanced and how afraid the Virginians were of them, he said that they expect Blackie will have no mercy on them and he knows that he understands bush fighting and the locality of the woods as well as themselves and can perhaps play hide and seek in them even better. Runaways, they gave. By mid-June, they were burning tobacco farms and liberating slaves. Cockburn praised how uncommonly and unexpectedly well the blacks have behaved in several engagements. Even though one of them was shot and died instantly in front of the others, it did not daunt or check them in the least, but on the contrary, animated them to seek revenge. He said that our skirmishers are fine light troops. It's astonishing with what rapidity and precision they advance. And there's a longer story that they give about one in particular that he um, became so close to that he was the only person that Cockburn had ever referred to as his friend in life. There's a beautiful short passage describing a night raid. Numbers of boats filled with armed men gliding in silence over the smooth water, arms glittering in the moonshine, oars just breaking the stillness of the night. The dark shade of the woods we are pushing for combined with expectation of danger to affect the mind. By mid-June they were burning to General Walter Smith of the militia recalled that each man more feared the enemy that he had left behind in the shape of a slave in his own house or plantation than he did anything else. So they fled and dispersed to protect their homes. In fact, there was no such plot, but the imagined internal enemy had won the battle. Chaos reigned in Washington, where many of the militiamen had fled. The president and his cabinet packed up their records and fled into the Maryland and Virginia countryside. Exploiting the confusion, local looters spread through the city even before the British arrived. Madison's body servant recalled a rabble taking advantage of the confusion, ran over all over the White House, and stole lots of silver and whatever they could lay their hands on. By dusk, the British troops marched into the city. Except for a few snipers, they faced no resistance. General Walter Smith of the militia recalled that each later in life, Michael Shiner recalled his boyhood as a slave in the capital, and nothing made a more vivid impression on him than the spectacle of the British entering. They looked like flames of fire with all of their red coats, and the stocks of their guns painted in red vermilion, and the ironwork shine like a Spanish dollar. Then, nine years old, Shiner started to run. But Miss Reed called him and asked him what did he think that the British wanted with him. The departing American officers had set fire to the Navy Yard and his ships, which lit up the sky with an immense red fireball. A British colonel recalled, I think this was one of the most finest and at the same time most awful sights I had ever witnessed, the columns of fire issuing from the houses, the dockyards. Later in the night, Cockburn ordered the mansion torched by 50 sailors and colonial marines who broke the windows with long poles and hurled bombs. So the fire took over the whole place and it was wrapped in flames and smoke. The militiamen died of malaria, of dysentery, of typhus, and 3,000 died of disease alone. Admiral Cockburn, he moved out of the Chesapeake to go down to the Sea Islands of Georgia to raid there as a distraction for the larger um, invasion that would come at New Orleans. The peace treaty was signed on December 24, 1814, but news did not reach the states until February 15th, and it was ratified two days later. Um, Major Edward Nichols, he established a fort in what's today Florida. 
Our grandpa, Jesse Wilson, is from Eufaula, Alabama. If you follow the Chattahoochee River outside of Eufaula South into the Seminole Lake, and the river coming out of that lake is where Negro Fort was located. Um, it was a magnet for runaways from Georgia. And um, eventually, two years later, it was destroyed um, and the, the soldiers who were there, who were stationed there, the African uh, refugees who were stationed there, many of them joined the Seminoles to continue their fight against the U.S. and others eventually made it out to the Bahamas. Now, Denmark Vesey, his unsuccessful plan or uh, revolt in, in Charleston, um, in his uh, plan, they thought that the British would help them, and on top of that, that they would be removed, that they would be taken to Saint Domingue. So the final chapter of Fire Bells uh, explains the context of the state situation after the war leading up to the Nat Turner's Rebellion in 1831. Instead of reading notes from the book on that chapter, I want to give a documentary, a few clips from a documentary. But there are two main points I want to make that are not included in the book, in the documentary, or in the film that was made about him, Birth of a Nation. Uh, first major point is that the southeast uh, Tidewater area, also Southampton County, was the area that had the highest proportion of, of free blacks already. Also, at the same time, this area, particularly to the east of Great Dismal Swamp, had the largest maroon community in the U.S. Uh, there was an area where, if you almost a circle around Southampton, where continuously every few years there were runaway blacks who had been fighting against the militia and who were striving to live an independent life within the state, within the country. Um, so this should be known. So there's a website that shows the location of the events during Nat Turner's um, rebellion. And basically, if you almost triangulate the three places that the Hunleys lived in, uh, in Southampton, the rebellion took place so close to two of those places. One of them, the closest one, the Barnes Church, where Nat Turner preached at, not, maybe not more than a mile or two away from Sunbeam which is where Mr. Albert Hunley uh, was born and grew up. There's Sunbeam, Boykins, also Seabrill, um, near St. Luke's uh, Way. So all of these events took place within 15 minutes walking distance from where our family comes from. And this one my daddy used to make liquor together <laughs> in all these woods. Oh, yeah? We heard about these stories. Yeah. Uh. They ain't stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's true life.